uh, I had to decide. I part of the fun was um deciding what Kingdom Hearts shirt should I wear for this. Oh thing. my god, I did that. <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which one should I wear? So I wore my uh my my vaporwave Sora. That like, was that is super cool. I love this. shirt. I've never so seen much. that shirt before. <laughs> it, it was like a hot topic shirt, but they nice. it was like a little while ago. But I definitely jumped on my chance to get it because it's um cool as hell. <laughs> so heck yeah, hot topic. <laughs> Kingdom Hearts. I got one one of the more recent ones. Yeah, yeah, I can see that the the they're like on like the Union Cross, the Union like, Cross Station of Awakening for some reason. <laughs> you know, just slap care. the assets together. It's it fine. Matter. It don't matter what matches. It's got Sora yeah. and Riku on it. I don't care what's in the background. <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, this is part three of the Sleeping Realm Theory, um, our Sleeping Realm Theory uh, audiobook for your listening pleasure. (laughs) And uh, we're going to take it right away uh, with Saving Aqua. Yes, wonderful. Wonderful. Saving Aqua. Okay. So, let's see, where were we? What would he talk about for? Okay, the breathing underwater. I was just backlogging a little bit anyway saving aqua hey speaking of the supposedly impossible saving aqua as they set it up shouldn't have ever happened uh it's established early on in the game that aqua was at the dark margin the same shore both sora and riku found themselves on at the end of kingdom hearts 2 this is confirmed again when she's later found there by riku and mickey on their return visit to the realm of darkness But, up until this point, their entire mission revolved around the need to find somebody who was close enough to Aqua to dive down deep enough to save her, like Riku had done for Sora. They have almost no options and resort to following her steps, trying to find anybody she may have been friends with. But we never actually see this come to fruition. Sora, with Ven's heart, is really the only one able to, but even he doesn't manage to get the chance. Riku and Mickey discover her unexplainably before Sora's intervention to save them. <clears throat> Even Aqua's descent into the abyss is almost the exact same as Sora's in Dream Drop Distance. Darkness spreads across their bodies until they are covered entirely, being dragged down into the abyss. Unlike uh, into the abyss, unlike Sora, who's had Ven's armor to who, unlike Sora, who had Ven's armor protect him directly from the darkness, Aqua was defenseless. <clears throat> Poor Aqua. Poor Aqua. She just gets to she just gets to take it all there. Oof. Just right into the goo. <clears throat> Their bodies are also similarly covered with a shadowy, inky black until it gives way to some more recognizable form. <clears throat> Leaps out. Uh, she's deep down there. We know this for a fact, as in deep down in darkness. Um, but we don't know how on earth they got to her, especially when they made a point of being unable to reach her down there without the aid of somebody she was close to. Uh, <clears throat> you want him to dive back into Sora's sleep? But master, Sora's heart is down in the darkest abyss. If Riku's not careful, he might just get trapped down there with him. <laughs> That is the best Mickey voice. Oh my. <laughs> I, thanks. <laughs> um, we brought up before how sleep and darkness intermingle, how darkness contains sleep. They're also both often presented or referred to as physically downwards. Dive to the heart, bottom of the abyss, falling into deep sleep, etc., etc. Um... Uh, all traces of her vanish into the great abyss beneath the realm of darkness beneath the realm of darkness you get the idea uh so at that point on this timeline they're already quote a layer of sleep deep uh one foot in the darkness if you will this would also quite physically place them closer to aqua who fell down into the abyss perhaps enabling a faint connection that otherwise would have been impossible in the waking world or like the first timeline more or less uh this is then made even more viable if you consider the entire game up to the point of saving her has had multiple drops deeper and deeper into sleep into the abyss and if that doesn't float your boat don't worry the game has got you covered 
What do we mean? Well, with the effects of diving into sleep, enabling Sora and company to breathe and speak underwater, did it occur to any of us to ask why exactly it is we can now just walk on water? Cause... Other than it just being sick as hell, of course. <laughs> <laughs> they have a battle on the water. <clears throat> because, no, it's not just something special to Aqua who has fallen to darkness, seeing as both Riku and Sora also walk all over it, no questions asked. It's also not something special to the Realm of Darkness either. We are shown earlier in the game itself, uh, before Aqua fell to darkness, actually before the events of the game even start, because this is a flashback, um, that when she's tossed like a rock, she sinks like one too. <laughs> and also, I wrote here, and I just, for those who know, and it's, I say the Wind Waker salvatory voice, that there's the uh, mini game where it's kind of like uh, you're shooting on a map to try and sink ships, and when you miss, and he goes, sploosh. Oh my god, I <laughs> remember like, that. Yeah, that's sploosh. what I wrote, that that sploosh, <laughs> sploosh. It's sploosh. <laughs> <laughs> now, boom. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yes, she sinks right into the water, just the way you would expect somebody to. This is within the realm of darkness, but it's very much in the real world, or first timeline, perhaps. Just we're not in we're not in sleep, right? Um, it's only after this we see her overcome with that creeping darkness. It's then that her hearts get lost. That her heart gets lost deeper down into the abyss, where Mickey can't reach her. Um, and it's later, when we finally catch up with her, do we get to see an almost exact repeat. A direct comparison from before, only this time she hits it like a solid surface before slowly sinking in. And you see her, when you look at both of these gifts, you see her, one she just flies back and splashes right in, and then this one she... she no sploosh in this one. No, no sploosh, no. <laughs> Oof. She just kind of slaps it like wet concrete, you know? <laughs> just... <laughs> Um, <clears throat> with each dive, the dream effects are cranked up, you know, potentially, both enabling them to reach her and enabling everybody to walk on water like it's yesterday's fad, no big deal. And with such a direct comparison, whether it's what we propose or not, it's hard to say something didn't change between then and now. Additionally, it's actually very reminiscent, once again, of Sora and his fall to darkness. After he's freed from Ventus's protective armor, he too hits the strange liquid surface like it's a solid before slowly sinking in. Those DDD parallels. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of those in this game. Lots of those. Sora, who we know is at the bottom of the abyss, and the direct comparison they use when speaking on Aqua's current situation. That all said, with having to dive as deep as they do, even to reach her, it, be it begs the question of how differently things could have gone in the first timeline. If they never had a means or connection strong enough to save Aqua, they potentially wouldn't have had all the Guardians of Light. The organization might have had to enact on their plans of utilizing the new seven princesses of heart. This too, the princesses, is another plot line brought up and dropped. Dropped, yes, because with Aqua and thus Ventus, they gathered all of the Guardians of Light, rendering the princesses unnecessary. The game even specifically mentions Kyrie is still a princess of heart, despite the rest giving up their lights, and this is never brought up again. But the fact remains that the chess game suggests seven lights had come to save Sora, when we never really found, found or even met all of them. However, one thing remains constant, princess or guardian, Kyrie would always remain a vital piece for Xehanort's plan, and would always be in danger. Wild. 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 It's some wild stuff. That's so true, though. <clears throat> a lot of parallels with the water and just like observations with water there's a lot of which is dark water water, <laughs> Lots water, of water being darkness mm. i mean even seeing like like aqua falling in and like riku when he was in the darkness of like the tornado of the well the tornado the <laughs> initially before he got his hair cut uh even then it's like water you know he can't like quite it's and there's like bubbles you know <laughs> it's just like <laughs> we're always shown it being represented as like water yeah i believe <clears throat> it's your turn now to read toy box toy this one's box. a little longer i think okay maybe toy box serves almost entirely as a rehash of the concepts from dream drop distance very strange, considering they completely omit it from the intro and fail to mention anything about dreams or other sleeping realm concepts. 
from the kidnapping and pointed use of possession to the separation yet unbreakable connection of friends between these two worlds. Toy Box covers most everything Dream Drop Distance made a point to introduce. In fact, the entire conflict is based around the fact that their world has been split in two. This is directly what happens in DDD, even with the way Joshua explains it. Did he say he made a copy of the real world? What's that mean? It probably means they split this world in two. Your friend in one world, us in the other. Only one of the worlds is real, and the other is just really convincing. Apparently, the world you and I are standing in right now, well, there are two copies of it. It's been sort of split in half. To boot, this secondary, really convincing world is what's enabling Buzz to use his laser. I admit, it does sound a little far-fetched. <laughs> but say we have, we have been taken to some kind of alternate world. That would explain why your laser's real. Just like a reality shift. Hmm. Hmm. And why Buzz's laser started actually lasering. <laughs> there he is. Using yeah. it. An actual laser. I mean, that's like in the Toy Story movies that he tries to use a laser, but they're like, dude, it's not real. Yeah, it's like, just what? like, you know, it's just a little red light. And But now it's just and like now it's actually a, real laser. a laser. What? Uh -huh. What? Why Buzz's laser started actually wow. lasering. <laughs> It's also kind of funny how this dreamlike double world enables really strange things that don't typically happen, like shooting lasers or, I don't know, breathing underwater. Super weird. This is also the world where we see young Master Xehanort, the most noted time traveler of the entire organization. It's his whole shtick, you see. <laughs> he also debuted in DDD as the main antagonist, Mystery, and one of the final bosses. His link to the game is not small. During his confrontation where Buzz is first possessed, Sora gives chase only to have YMX vanishing with every swing, seemingly teleporting around or warping through time in some way. Because he do that with his super cool anime teleportation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, this guy. Mm -hmm. This this choo, guy over choo, here. This guy. Super cool <laughs> anime teleport. Yeah, he just does it over and over again. Like, you're just walking around. Just like, hey, catch me. Mm -hmm. ha -ha. Almost like he can predict Sora's movements. Mm -hmm. Like he's done this before. Very, like he's done this before. Very interesting. Because mm. it's not like we see him do this in other examples really at all. Right. Like, there's him like he's able to do like time warpy stuff, but like not like not this. this. You know, it's not over just like and over he, he again. Catch me if you can. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, he just <laughs> we never see this before. Around. <sighs> Sora can't land a single blow on him while he's monologuing, and in all our encounters with YMX before, we never quite saw him do this on such a scale. Talking and dodging every swipe with no reaction, most notably while not even facing Sora, reeks of a 13-year-old super cool self-insert character, but more importantly, <laughs> time travel or a repeated encounter. Following up on this, when Sora realizes he can't do anything against YMX, he decides to help his friends instead before getting nabbed by the wrist. Then, bla blasting Sora into Verum Rex, he says a very pointed and unprompted, not this time. What? Ooh, what? <laughs> Almost as if this has happened once before. Dun dun dun. What? <laughs> what? what? That's stupid. So That's weird. Stupid idea. What? It's strange how DDD is the prelude game to KH3, and yet it seems like they omitted the most vital world-building aspect that game introduced, dream worlds. And they are vital, given that the entirety of Union Cross is also a dream retelling of events, in order to save the dandelions from the aftermath of the Keyblade War. It's weird that dream worlds would play such a huge role in two games leading up to KH3, only for them to seemingly not be a part of the plot or even mentioned. It's so careful how sparingly the game says the word dream at all, especially considering this entire world and its blatant reuse of the concepts, <laughs> almost like it might be on purpose. To make but I'm not. I mean, you know, don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay. Deja vu. I like this one a lot. Um, <clears throat> relived again and again like deja vu. 
Within Kingdom Hearts, there's a general rule of thumb that even though the mind may not remember, the heart never forgets. This was established pretty early as a concept with the, with Chain of Memories. Imagine with a name like that. <clears throat> if the Chain of Memories comes apart, the links will still be there, right? So the memory of our promise will always be inside me somewhere. This specific example is even further proven by being one of the memories Sora can choose from during his dive to the heart, something he otherwise can't actively recall, but it remains within him. The power of the Guardian. Kindness to aid friends. This is also kind of the idea behind some of the some of the effects of time travel. If traveling through and into the future, your experiences and memories don't come back with you once you return to the past. You continue to live your life, but with an underlying subliminal need or sense to follow whatever brings you to the future you've experienced, as, quote, it has been etched into your heart. It's a convenient continuity failsafe. <laughs> time travel. <laughs> oh, time travel. Mm, while I know this future now that I have lived it, returning to my own time will erase the memories and experiences I have gained here. Still, my appointed path is now etched in my heart, which will first lead me to seek the outside world. So, regardless of the means, time travel, memory erasure, etc., having experienced something guarantees that the memory still remains somewhere deep within your heart. We see what seems like evidence of this throughout the game, like, a lot. A lot, a lot. A notable amount of verbalized forgetting of details, characters reacting to something before it happens or aren't present for, or unwar unwarranted familiarity with a given situation. In most in instances, characters even provide an easy-to-swallow explanation for it, seeming to deliberately hand-wave the issue so you don't take much notice. <clears throat> Uh, the game begins with a cutscene from the end of 0 0.2. This functions as a mean to refresh players of what Sora needs to do, but they have a very interesting conversation where Goofy brings up the very important phrase, may your heart be your guiding key, something they've never heard yet. But Goofy insists he had. Um, boop, boop. May your heart be your guiding key. It's like, huh, what's that? <clears throat> Master Yen said... <laughs> I'm not, sorry. <laughs> sorry for my lack of goofy impression. I love your goofy <clears throat> impression. <clears throat> oh, thank, thank you. I'll I'll give it a shot for you. Um, <clears throat> Master Yen said all that right before we went off on any of our real important adventures. It's not good, but... <laughs> so good. <clears throat> really? So good. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> and I'm sure you're too kind. It's not... <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway, um... Uh, or really? Maybe? And then he's like, ooh, maybe I just imagined it. <laughs> mm. uh, even with the implication that the timeline restart happens at the end of 2.9, we're still including the scene and how how pointedly odd it is. It's so uh, weird. I remember playing that and being like, what? Like, what? Yeah, what? What? The fuck? what? And it, it's, it's definitely something that it's just like, that could very easily be something that's just like, oh, we wanted to tie this in. We'll just say that they don't remember hearing it, but like Goofy picked it up, you know? And yeah. like, it could just be, they're just kind of writing it in. But that's why we're just putting it in because we're like, that's weird. We'll just, here you go. Like, it's <laughs> as weird as anything else. We might as well point it out, but like there are right. many more paths to that. <clears throat> uh, and then we have Twilight Town. Where Sora's just like, oh man, you know, he runs in and he's like, the tram is still here. And he's acting, all and they're like, Sora, it hasn't been that long. And he's like, it feels like it. And they're like, oh, maybe you're feeling what Roxas feels because he misses home, which is very possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it does keep going, though, as well. Um, you know, Hainer, Pencilette, it's been ages. And it's just like, what? It hasn't been that long. But here's a fun note in Jiminy's journal. It says that Hainer, Pence, and Olette are still on their summer vacation. Uh, so it really hasn't been that long at all. <laughs> Not to mention any other timeline we have been shown of the situation is just, like, all of Kingdom Hearts that we know has been over an incredibly short period of time, actually. Yeah, yeah. Or at least shorter than you expect, so. It's odd in that regard. Oh, hi, baby! He's he's back. He's wandering around. <clears throat> um, And then we have toy box it's just like wait uh uh you look familiar i know this you're uh you're and then he's like hey, you're zora, zora. <laughs> which is like its own box of strange just because it's just like yeah he's wearing his clothes but he doesn't actually look 
anything like him. In fact, it's Riku that looks exactly like yeah. him, and they say this. But even then, we have like other connections where like the Kingstagram Sora's like, ah, he looks just like Riku. I feel like connected to him in some way, like to Yozora. Yeah. And it's just like interesting. But we didn't get that in English, actually. We got a different one. It was translated like to a completely different thing for some reason. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have that, we have, uh, over-familiarity, we have, um, in Corona, she's like, yep, uh, unforgettable, and he's like, all for one and one for all. And Sora's mentioning of this line is interesting as a direct reference to Dream Drop Distance. In the Country of Musketeers, uh, Sora runs into Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, and has a little diff- and has a little difficulty dealing with meeting his friends who don't know or remember him. Regardless, he keeps the experience and phrase close to his heart, which makes it stand out that he says it to himself like a reassurance. Oh. <laughs> uh, and then we have we get the we get the monster take. Just like, oh, that's not that's not the heartless emblem. And it's like, and how come I feel like I might have seen him before? Hmm, it's on the tip of my tongue. I remember the king told us something about negative emotions. <laughs> Goofy the wise. What would we do without uh-huh. Goofy? <laughs> Goofy with the only brain cell out of the three of them. <laughs> unversed Uh uh-huh a while back the king fought a whole bunch of battles against him uh note we went through birth by sleep and confirmed donald and goofy never leave yensid's tower they never see the unversed for themselves uh goofy goes from feeling like he's quote seen them before to to confirming only mickey ever fought and told him about them uh you could say it's just a continuity issue but birth by sleep and dream drop distance were planned at the same time to lead into kingdom hearts 3 and the series has stayed remarkably consistent with itself especially post 2010 and all of that doesn't explain why goofy wouldn't would contradict himself in his very next sentence like he went from i feel like i have seen them before to oh yeah the king told me about them so still odd uh and then we have Pooh uh hmm let me see i don't remember anything oddish but perhaps i've forgotten uh would anyone else care to remember why we're here um and then so i was worried that i might have forgotten you away because he was talking about like that's a separate scene but he does talk about how he's just like sora why did you leave my heart <laughs> oh. and he's just like he's just like where did, where did you go where did our connection go kind of a thing um, Pooh being forgetful isn't anything new, but for what little time we spend here, coupled with everyone else struggling to remember what they weren't even there for, it stands out. Like, everyone showed up to do something, and then nobody remembers what they're there to do. So. Uh, and then we have Arendelle. I would keep wanting to say, like, the movie names only, and I'm like, and then we right. have Frozen! And I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm not wrong, but... <laughs> uh, alright, I know we just met, but Sora, was it? I get the feeling that you're someone to trust. He's like, I'm right there with you. Hmm. And then this one was another pointed thing where she's like, the sea belongs to everyone. Um, and then Donald's like, I said that. Don't copy my expressions. And he's like, huh? You did? <laughs> and sometimes it just goes in one ear and right out the other. And then he's like, wait, really? And it's like at the beginning oh. of Pirates of the Caribbean, when they go into Davy Jones' locker, they're like, like Donald's just like, yeah, the sea is for everyone. And Sora's like, yeah, <laughs> no conquerors. <laughs> And, but then, like, later they say it again, and he's just like, I said that. And Sora's like, wait, hold on, you did? Like, it's not just like, oh, whoops, he he, but, like, he's right. just like, wait, no, wait, are you serious? Did you actually say that? What's, hold on. It's such and a it's weird like, thing. Like, this, this, this is, like, written. This is, like, they put this in the script, they approved mm-hmm. it. Like, this isn't just like, oh, that's kind of weird, the character's being silly. Like, this is yeah, intentional. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, exactly. Like, it's written, and it's, like, played out longer than you'd expect for just, like, a goof. Because if right. it was just, like, oh, just, like, hey, I said that, and sort of be like, oh, what? Ah, uh, yeah, who cares, you know? And, like, right. some kind of, but he's, he asks, like, more than once, and he's like, wait, are you serious? Like, did you actually say that? I don't, and, like, another point of this is that, like, the first time it is said at the beginning of the uh, the world, but then in the middle, they have a supposed drop after Sora falls into the ocean. So this happens after that. So potentially it could be like, now we're in another layer deep and like, we have forgotten more. And it's just right. like- it... And it's happening <laughs> anyway. in like every world. Like you can see, like, at, like, like it, it keeps happening. Something where it's just like over familiarity or something yeah. that's like, you know, oh, I forgot this. Why is this happening? Uh, this, 
And there's another one we bring up. It even also happens in Olympus. But we brought it up in a later part. Mm. So we'll get to it. But uh, So we have Big Hero 6. Um, well, I gotta tell Riku what a blast this place is. But we just got here. We haven't even done anything yet. That could also... Like, a lot of these can just be, like, nothing. But it's, like, so consistent that it's just, right. like... It just is, like... What is it? it just, <laughs> this can't just be here for no reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's Riku stops him from using magic. Uh, him being uh, Michael Mouse, <laughs> if you will. Uh, if you try to use time magic against these numbers, you won't have enough strength for the final battle. Again, another thing that could just be like, you know, he's just knowledgeable. It's like, hey, don't overexert yourself. But And then, of course, we have the final world with Chirithi and just the straight up statement, you have wandered here more than once before on your visits to the Station of Awakening. More than once, despite the fact we have only visited here during that first dive. Like, that in itself means it's like, he has gone there multiple times without us, the audience, having seen. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's there's that. But there's just, like, a repeated, like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> uh, initially, in that section, we also had the uh, Sora reacting to uh, Anna getting hit. But, like, as we were like, oh, hold oh. on. There's a different connection here. Yeah. Hold on a second. <laughs> There's some princess power at play. <laughs> but. Ah. I love it. All right. Promotional material. Interestingly, early advertising for the game lead trailers with this quote. Don't assume your dreams are just a fantasy. If you can imagine a world, believe in it and dive in. The 2017... Oh, that was from the 2017 yeah, Orchestra yep. trailer. Mm -hmm. Don't Again, don't assume your dreams are just fantasy. If you can imagine a world, believe in it and dive in. From the Toy Story trailer, 2017. Before it just disappeared from promotional material entirely. Later, mm. official sources started to use a simple but unrelated specific hashtag, Yume Shikanai. Translated to only dream, or just there is only a dream. The first time it's used was the six days to go countdown. It was- I remember that was coming, when that was coming out, like, actively. And we were like, hey man, what the fuck, what is this? What? <laughs> what's, what? Go what's going on here? Because we were already kind of being like, what is, uh happening because like don't forget i got the game really early too so like seeing the promotional stuff ahead of time and we were like what is this dream stuff it keeps talking right? about for some reason you know anyway sorry <laughs> last little bit there <laughs> uh it was then used moving forward in all promotional tweets including release day playstation japan was also using the tag the last time they used this was the secret movie announcement tweet yep just Ah, like Funny why? how that one also was why a dream. <laughs> only dream, only a dream. Yeah, we know for sure it was. Seems pretty, dream. pretty direct. Like what? I know it's very like specific, and it's like not really anything to do with what actually like what we are surface level presented in game. Right, and it's like not the only thing to bring up like this dream stuff with it, and then like the game to be like like leading up, you'd be like, well you know dream drop whatever like you wouldn't think anything of it and then they kind of just don't touch it whatsoever unless what we think is happening is you know kind of definitely ties in so yeah <laughs> um oh, this boy. part blew my mind i was like what <laughs> come this on one is like super make or break for most people and like honestly it's mostly just like kind of like i would say it's goofy and funny but it's like something i would never put past nomura to like do oh yeah like it's totally within the wheelhouse of like just dumb shit he would pull that i adore but it's like some <laughs> people see this and they're either like no way or they're like all right you lost me this is dumb as hell and i'm right. like man you you mickey mouse is in this game i don't know where you're drawing the line here <laughs> like <laughs> sora um, is talking to winnie the pooh for like the yeah. third time i mean <laughs> yeah this, this, this is not this was yet another one that I was just like, I, I'm, I'm freaking sold. Like, what? Mm -hmm. I was just like, mm -hmm. I am sold. This is fact. 
<laughs> I just I love to see it because I love seeing like people's reactions to this part specifically. Because yes. even sometimes people are like, "Oh, this is so dumb," but they're kind of <laughs> mad because it's plausible, right? You know? Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, I think, oh, that's, I'm sorry, I think dude. that's why a lot of people are mad at the theory in general because yeah. they're just like, it makes too much sense. No, I refuse. I refuse. Yeah. I know that's how it was with like a uh, Barry when he was going through it with Gam. Was a lot of it was just like I'm so pissed that this is completely like actually plausible. Like every yeah. bit of it is just like definitely it's like way oh, too Barry. meta. Barry, I can Barry. <laughs> but yeah, it's just like oh, it's not just pulling it out of thin air. It's just like all of this stuff is like things the series has done before. I'm yep. sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry we have to be the bearer of bad the bearer news. Of just facts. <laughs> The bearer of news. <laughs> but anyway, the half a lump. And then there's Lumpy. <laughs> and I'm Lumpy. Nice to meet you. Yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and the thing is, I do love the little movie that like Lumpy's in. It's very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I like Lumpy. <laughs> and I mean that earnestly. Lumpy is cute. Anyway. Um, now, take this as you will, as it seems uh, a bit goofy, but we can't deny that it lines up with everything else. <laughs> Do consider, though, that it's really funny to have <laughs> to have to literally point out the elephant in the room. <laughs> anyway. Literally. <laughs> Lumpy the Heffalump is met with little fanfare and a straightforward introduction. So far as worlds are concerned, the 100 Acre Woods is a simple little world with one minigame slightly remixed a couple times. For something so small, it's odd that it took the time at all to add Lumpy, even at the expense of other staple, ca staple cast members like Eeyore, Kanga, or Owl. Another interesting thing about Lumpy as a character, uh, totally unacknowledged by any piece of Winnie the Pooh media for 10 years, until Kingdom Hearts 3. So why is he here? <laughs> and, like, we checked. You have to know. We were, like, looking back. We were like, when's the last time Lumpy, like... Is he included because of, like, relevance? Like, oh, we should update the Winnie the Pooh world and put Lumpy in? <laughs> and we were like, aside from, like, oh, we made a movie with Lumpy in it, and I think Lumpy got, like, included in, got included in, like, a a, a small, like, show. Like, it didn't run very, like, too long, but it was, like, it in a Winnie the Pooh show for a while, and then that ended. And then it's been, like, ten years, and there's, like, nothing. And we they're don't like know what we're like. him out of the archives. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Why? Was, like, that's like, we only say that because we went and looked. That we were like, okay, could it possibly be because like, he's just relevant and like, should and this should be updated? And we're like, no, <laughs> not at all. Why is he here? Um, let's, so let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, unacknowledged by any piece of Winnie the Pooh media for 10 years until Kingdom Hearts 3. So why is he here? Uh, up until his own movie, Heffalumps didn't actually exist. They were more like spooks in the night, nightmares or boogeymen. Um, and in quotes, uh, just like the sole appearance of Heffalumps in the books is imagined as Pooh tries to put himself to sleep. And it's the Heffalumps and Woozles and he's having nightmares about those boogie, spooky dookie boys. <laughs> so, um, so to put it simply, Heffalumps only appear in dreams up until <laughs> Lumpy, obviously. Um, the world itself seems to be used primarily as a story beat pointing out Sora's fear, his weakening connection with his friends, so it stands to reason that a purposely placed side character that hasn't been in anything since 2008 is such a small in such a small world with some pointed theming could very well be important. Lumpy the Heffalump! Vital dream clue! And, and and thank you, chat, for reminding us that, like, people who come here, like, oh, Lumpy, come on, that is so stretching, that is such a good, far out, come on, now you're just, an X on Sora's shirt. Yeah, an X on Sora's shirt. <laughs> like, are you I hate this. It's, like, hate it's really like, more. it's really like the bar was put, like, so low that you just can't discredit literally anything, no. and it's exhausting. It's exhausting. <laughs> I'm tired. I wrote too much about this, okay? <laughs> I'm tired. No, Mora. I don't suggest. like what you put me through, <laughs> but I enjoy it. I love digging up every little thing, and it's like, we know he wants that, because it's like, it's just, I like to make thing that people can discuss and have fun with yep. by themselves. Right, we're yep. doing it, but also, could you at least just cut me some slack? I am so <laughs> <laughs> tired. I'm tired. I know facts about Lumpy the Heffalump. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Uh... 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> the bar is so low. X on a t-shirt, <laughs> anything is viable. Right. Including sleeping keyholes. Yes. Sleeping keyholes are introduced in DDD, used both as a means of entering the sleeping realm as well as awaken a sleeping world from its slumber. Starkly different from world keyholes. Every sleeping keyhole uses the same grand motifs, motifs and overall look. When unlocked, a large circular section of the background behind it disappears with an effect reminiscent of shattering glass, revealing intricate designs and symbols underneath. They are so unique and towards the end, KH3 is riddled with them. The keyholes in DDD, the former from when they first fight Ursula and first enter the fake worlds, the second in Traverse Town, and the third near the end when Riku unlocks Sora's heart. Ew, they're really cool looking. Like, look at this. Like, yeah, they are. Like the kaleidoscope imagery. Specifically designed to be the sleeping keyhole. Mm-hmm. The keyhole Sora opens in the final world to save his friends' hearts in sleeping worlds. Look at that. Ooh. And then the keyhole the rest of the cast uses to enter Scala Ad Calum. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. Look at us. <laughs> the keyhole Sora opens when he says he knows how to save Kyrie. Hey. Look at that. Wow. That is really cool. If if anything, like the major point was like, uh, with this, we were trying to point out the fact that it was like there was a lot to do with sleep that is happening. That is just like especially if this is kind of like a lot of this is kind of like post world line connection right so now we should be in reality so this would like mm -hmm. indicate whatever it is either we have it is like this is how we are entering sleep in some capacity or like what have you where it just didn't really <sighs> because sleep let's see the final world you have to be in a state of sleep to get to more or less it's like it's kind of just like because it's sleep and death touch and then and, 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 yeah. <laughs> and um other points that like nomura made about just like ah they are very much connected but it's it's just very specific um and just kind of a constant and we really just wanted to point them out as to not just like take it for granted that it's like cool keyhole thing we're like no this is a very specific thing and it has to do with sleep as does a lot of stuff from this game so uh I don't know. It, it's not like uh, the biggest point, but it's like something that we were like, please, please see it at least. Right. <laughs> please <laughs> see the sleeping. that it's the same keyhole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, does Data Dream of Electra Electric Tama Sheep. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, thanks. So. I was, uh, was uh, proud of that one. Anyway. <laughs> Um, there's something we'd like to clarify really quick in regards to updates with Cucks over the past. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, Kingdom Hearts Union Cross. <laughs> <laughs> Cucks. Over, uh, over the past. It, rest in peace. Rest in peace, oh, Union Cross. Oh, man. Now that we're getting shut From down. From the last so stream, we got yeah, the bad news. That week, and uh, it's just like, ah, guess what? <laughs> over one out. F's in the chat for Union Cross. Yep. Uh. <laughs> um oh boy what was the yeah in a union cross over the past year and what it means for the sleeping realm um because people had been bringing up because right after we released this and we were like all of this stuff happening in sleep and one of our biggest points was like union cross happens in sleep there's a whole lot pointing and saying that this stuff happens in sleep and they're dreaming and memories and all of this stuff um, but then with Union Cross, it was like, ooh, what's going on? Everything's all data-y, and what's going on with Daybreak Town? Everything's just riddled with data, and a lot of people took this, and they were like, oh, I guess you guys were wrong then. This is just, you know, you were wrong, it's data, so all of this debunked, and we were like, N no, we're, I mean, we're still learning about stuff, sure, but, like, they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, which is what this goes on to talk about. But, like, I very specifically had to go and write this and be like, listen. <laughs> you listen here, little man. I know what I'm talking about. I promise. <laughs> but, um, anyway, uh, let's see. The updates, blah, 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 what it means for the sleeping realm, uh, and big, bold <laughs> data and dreams are not mutually exclusive. 
there seems to be an idea that because uh, Union Cross is happening within data, that the involvement of dreams is now a moot point or was incorrectly understood. We simply bring this up as it seems really pertinent moving forward with the series and as an explanation for those who thought our understanding of world lines turned out to be bunk. Um, so as we explained at the very beginning, Kingdom Hearts Key to Kingdom Hearts Union Cross is a world line hop, which is described as going to a place made of dreams, a timeline without defeat. Data is involved in this specific jump by means of data recreations of the worlds you travel to. Originally, the foretellers projected the worlds we visit from the Book of Prophecies, and without the foretellers around, they needed a replacement, hence data recreations. The union leaders are also entirely aware of this aspect. Their understanding is that there is a real daybreak town at the center. This center then seamlessly bleeds into a data version of Daybreak Town, which allows travel to other worlds, these data worlds, these data recreations. Um, this is all well and good until it turns out, much to their surprise, that everything is data. Uh, I thought we were in the real Daybreak Town, but it seems we're actually in the data world. This is presented as if they've been tricked, something they weren't they were entirely unaware of set up by someone else's meddling. What this means is we thought we'd gone back when we actually hadn't to the real world. Uh, I'm convinced someone set this whole thing up. So the leap we took to avoid the war only served to land us in a cage. This last line is, particular, is a particularly concise summary. They went through the process of world line hopping only to pop out in the wrong place in a trap. The point is the description for how slash what goes into world line hopping as described by Ava and Master of Masters is still unaffected. The unchanged state being presented as a form within the dream that it would be like a dream until meeting the point of defeat and overriding it all remains true. This aside, this doesn't mean we haven't been shown elsewhere that data and dreams can coexist. Like we said, they aren't mutually exclusive and have actually almost always been presented as interwoven and closely linked. Within Dream Drop Distance, we were uh, where we we're first introduced to the concept of dream worlds, we travel to the grid, which is not its strongest world, but... <laughs> <laughs> The grid is undeniably data and explained to us as the original of what Ansem the Wise copied for his own use, which was space paranoids from K good old cage Two, perfect space paranoids, my favorite. <laughs> and that's not on air. I just fucking, I just really love space paranoids. <laughs> but DDD um, gave us Riku on a motorcycle. It did give us Riku on a motorcycle. And I love that. <laughs> doesn't make it a great world. though. No, no it doesn't <laughs> no, make up for no. Oh, the grid. Anyway, once my master, Ansem, found an old system and made a copy of its uh, master control program. This is the original data of that system. Young Master Xehanort doubles up on this, claiming this isn't even in the realm of sleep, as data does not dream. Uh, you think this is the realm of dreams. Data does not dream. Cannot dream. But despite what young Master Xehanort says, sleeping keyholes are still found here and counted among the keyholes necessary to pass the test and gain the power of waking. And in accordance with their plan, plunging Sora even deeper into sleep. Later, after said plan induces this deep sleep, Riku runs into a data recreation of Ansem the Wise within Sora's own heart. This version of himself was stored within Sora during his year of sleep to protect data he thought would be useful in helping return those who are lost. Furthermore, during this year of sleep, fixing and reconnecting the chain of Sora's memories is shown using computers and data. Sora is asleep, all while Roxas lives his new life within a data twilight town. As a final point, within Recoded, Data Sora's Keyblade is broken by Maleficent, as she comments on how it's a fake. Data Sora later forges a Keyblade to save Donald and Goofy, proving he has a heart of his very own. <laughs> the, keyb <laughs> the Keyblade's power comes from the wielder's strength of heart. Once an old friend said to me, a heart is so much more than any system. This old friend he's referring to is, unsurprisingly, Ansem the Wise. <clears throat> that weapon was just a replica. It didn't have any substance. That's why Maleficent could destroy it so easily. You've become more than the system, Sora. He's a real boy now. Yay! Yay. <clears throat> uh, 
the series proves time and time again that any form of life is entirely valid, that your memories and experiences are what make you, you. Anything can have its own heart and life. Data, entire worlds, nobodies, or otherwise. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now I've got it. <laughs> and you gotta know, it is a binary for the... It, it does say heart. Does <laughs> so, it really? Yes. I went and like, put it in, and then I just like really crappily put a little black box and just copy pasted the binary into it yes. <laughs> <laughs> and having a heart of course means you can dream of electric tama sheep so <laughs> i wanted you to read that as like the aol like dial, dial up noise <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, and just it's just so kind of long oh <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Oh, beautiful. I, I would absolutely do it for the joke, but it's also long, and I'm like, oh, what is it? Let's just do it. Let's, you get it. You get the joke. You can see it with your eyes. <laughs> what we can also see is this beautiful canary, canary title card. True love and separation. This was one that was, like, just a thumbnail, and I was just like, no, this is beautiful. We must make it Gorgeous. something. Yes. Yes. And see, there you got the real Kingdom Hearts, and you got the fake Kingdom uh -huh. Hearts. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Love it. Fantastic. Beautiful. Love that. Reinforced theming. True love and separation. Now, I know this is going to sound like the most bonkers claim we've made thus far, but are you sure? KH3 mm. <laughs> has some of the most thematic world cohesion out of any game in the series. Every single world follows a recurrent theme, to protect somebody precious. The Ultimania even clarifies this, with each world we visit containing clues to regaining the power of waking. Though he's also a bit naive, Sora's special trait is that he's always optimistic. Within the places he visits, a clue to regaining his powers, to protect a precious person with all your heart, is found. From Sora's character bio in the KH3 Ultimania. The theme is then generally explored in one of two ways, choosing between what's expected of or for you versus what you truly want or love, and the difficulties, grief, and ultimately the necessity of separation. In essence, true love and separation. So yes, the Disney worlds are actually important. Imagine that. Wow. Oh my gosh, <laughs> pay attention. I would say that they typically are on like at least a thematic level mm -hmm. they aren't like brainlessly put in to varying levels of like how easily you can read it but like yeah. they are typically actually very consistent if you just look at it but it, it most of the time i understand a lot of people just going through and they're like i get it i'm going through mulan right. <laughs> you know, wow. but like <laughs> there's typically like i think i didn't even realize until someone pointed out that kingdom hearts 2 all of like the themes of the world were like people trying to discover themselves mm. and i was like Oh, sh dead ass! <laughs> I was like, "What? Oh, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, anyway, that fits." So it's just like stuff like that is like typically it's it's more mindful than you would expect, but this one mm -hmm. was very pertinent and like spoken on, and not just here. They also mention it in like Melody of Memory, and that like Sora's traveling through and like kind of learning these lessons from yeah. the worlds that he's going to. Anyway, yeah. continue. <laughs> yeah. He's seeing it right in front of him. The Disney mm -hmm, worlds are mm -hmm. actually important, and you have Sora's heart to thank for that. Thank you, Sora's heart. Thank you, thank Sora's, you heart. Sora's heart. <laughs> okay. Guided by the heart. For the first time outside of Key slash uh, Union Cross, uh, we're introduced to the phrase, may your heart be your guiding key, and a powerful phrase it is. While it might seem like just a general tie-in to another aspect of the franchise, it seems to be frequently missed that with this phrase, Sora's heart is literally guiding him to every world we visit, and it's doing so with purpose. It's been at it since the very beginning. From Olympus, may my heart be my guiding key, heart... It's a gate! <laughs> wow! Uh, down to the very end, Destiny Islands. Uh, may my heart be my guiding key. It'll show us the way. Drum roll, please. Boom! We got a gate. Um, and in this case, specifically, Sora is faced with no other known options. He takes a shot in the dark, and his heart leads him right to where he needs to go, as if his heart knows something he doesn't. 
Even upon arrival, he questions why he was led there, not knowing why himself. Why do you why do you think that gate took us here? And this isn't even the first time, seeing as the gang questions it directly while in Corona at the very beginning. Why do you think we came here? Got me, Donald. We'll figure it out as we go. I'm sure we were brought to I'm sure we were brought to this world for some good reason, but can't we sweat it later? <laughs> As Sora says, they were brought here, and by some kind of decision slash power they aren't privy to, aka Sora's heart, his guiding key. The key that is guiding him with his heart, <laughs> Sora's heart. <laughs> uh, the point here is, the worlds serve an actual in-game narrative purpose, and the lessons learned there are the key to Sora regaining his power. So there, there's thought, there's thought in these here worlds. It makes it makes too much sense. I can't handle it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't handle it. It's too, uh. So true love. People always do crazy things when they're in love. Wink, wink. Aha. Hercules looks so cute in the shot. <laughs> Doesn't <of> he? <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Herc is cute. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> true love, whether it be romantic, familial, platonic, whatever you want. Whatever you want. <laughs> and the power gained through it, sacrifice in the name of love and revival. These worlds focus on stories that often have a character first chasing what they think they want until they find what they truly want in the end, often presented with a choice between their newly understood love and a world without it. What these worlds also do is serve to lay the groundwork for the mechanics of true love sacrifice, to sacrifice yourself without hesitation wanting nothing else but to protect someone you care about. Olympus. This world's theme is very literal in that strength is drawn from love for others, as in, like, physical strength. Specifically for Herc, his strength is coming from his desire to protect Meg. Sora comes to Olympus, looking for a way to regain his lost strength, recalling Hercules going through the same issue in Kingdom Hearts 2. Hercules got his strength back by throwing himself into danger for the sake of the person he loves. He wanted nothing else but to protect Meg with his whole heart, regardless of the risk. A crazy stunt, as Sora called it. Just no more crazy stunts. Will this be relevant again? But be safe. No reckless stunts. Eight Ball says yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Um, so while we don't actually see Hercules sacrifice himself in this world, it's explicitly talked about and called back on. It's the entire reason Sora came here in the first place. While looking for a way to find his strength, Sora helps Hercules thwart Hades and save Hercules' family, an important love in its own right. But when asked why he doesn't stay on Olympus, Mountain of the Gods, Hercules makes his choice clear. Are you sure you want to leave all this behind? Well, I can see my family anytime I want. If I stayed, I'd have to be apart from the person I love most, and that life would be empty. I finally know where I belong. It's just like... Hercules, you're gonna have a big hug. Where I belong. <laughs> I, I love that song. I love Hercules. Oh, I, love I love that, that song. It's, it's so good. I love that movie. Uh. <laughs> it's one of those movies that like I can watch anytime. Like uh, just repeatedly, I, I just watch throw it, it on. It's been like so long. I just listen to the songs. So the songs good. are so good. It's well, the songs are so good. This is the thing. You're not wrong, <laughs> but the movie <laughs> is also such a treat. Not the most incredible movie i definitely recommend uh lindsay ellis's video about it it's fantastic yes but <laughs> um anyway off topic uh, on topic off topic side topic tangent that's the word we're looking for anyway though we don't get much of it within kingdom hearts olympus usually serving less as a means for narrative and more as a catalyst for the coliseum though that's not always true there is like narrative kind of ties and stuff in there usually just small uh we do get kind of a follow-through on the movie plot in the movie, Hercules is chasing his dream to live on Mount, Mount Olympus to live with the rest of his family where he believes he belongs. This is his main driving goal, but along the way, he finds his love with Meg, finding by, at the, finding by the end that what he thought he wanted isn't what he truly wanted after all. So cute. <clears throat> Corona. Sora and Rapunzel share a lot of common ground. From their fun, cheery personality, ability to make friends with most anyone wild hair and a curiosity about the world about them that uh a world, world eh, 
a curiosity <laughs> about the world around them, they get along great. The outside world must seem so big and scary. I know how she feels. I would like to point out something really quick that uh, in the novel, actually, at this point, uh, Sora looks at Rapunzel's excitement for the outside world. And it reminds him of Riku, actually, where he's just really? like, yeah, you know, yeah, he actually like thinks about and like it reminds him of Riku very specifically. And then he thinks about like, you know, maybe how we got off of the islands wasn't the best, like the, you know, plunging everything in darkness thing. But he's just like, I still don't like regret it though and like with everything that came with it and the friends that we have made that it's just like i still think you know i'm still happy like with what what has happened but it was like specifically he is reminded of riku in like her excitement to see the outside world wow so, that's a fun fact for you nice <laughs> anyway if, carry on love it and with this sora personally relates with rapunzel and her anxieties about her first time out in the world he was in her shoes once, or lack thereof. He was excited, sure, but scared. He gets it, and makes sure to help her have the most fun she can to chase down her dream. And then we get Sora with, like, little birds, like, yeah. <laughs> bringing oh, the birds yeah, I love to it. Rapunzel. Oh, come what a dream come true. Disney princess <laughs> Sora. I love it so much. Love it. It's so sweet. It, it was really just like, I was like, wow, I'm being so catered to right now. I love him with my <laughs> whole heart. Game. Oh, so much fan service in KH3. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Along the way to her current dream, the lanterns, she gains a new one, as does Eugene. What if it's not everything I dreamed it would be? Well, that's the good part, I guess. You get to go find a new dream. Sometimes what you think was your dream or desire doesn't pan out. But as you grow and learn and change, a new one takes its place. But outside forces oftentimes will intervene for, the, for their own purposes. Watch this live Woo! edit. All right. Boom. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Despite outside interference and manipulation from Mother Gothel to hide Rapunzel's past and keep her locked up for herself, Rapunzel and Eugene's willingness to give up everything for each other without a second he he second's hesitation wins out. Rapunzel, you were my new dream. And you were mine. Literally dying for Rapunzel to keep her freedom in an act of true love and care for another person. Rapunzel's tears and healing song that literally talks about reversing time revive him. <laughs> oh, I, I apologize for my singing. <laughs> Flower gleam and glow, let your power shine. Make the clock reverse, bring back what once was mine. Heal what has been hurt, change the fate's design, save what has been lost, bring back what once was mine. What once was mine. <laughs> 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 okay. I touched my glasses. <laughs> I did a joke, but I uh, lenses. Anyway, I apologize. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. Look at that. Oh, he's all better. In the end, her willingness to sacrifice her freedom to save Eugene and Eugene's own self-sacrifice to set Rapunzel free saved them both. Acts of true love and with it, the power of resurrection. <laughs> Quite literally in one case. And then, literally. You know. Boom. <laughs> <sighs> okay, I can see now. <clears throat> Arendelle. Hey, so this world is packed with pointed narratives and parallels. We don't even have to personally point out, though we will, because Sora does that himself several times. Sora very quickly takes interest in Elsa's well-being, recognizing something familiar in her behavior. He becomes very personally alarmed and worried as what she says hits so close to home. <clears throat> this is my home now. I can't go back. I don't want to hurt anyone. What? <laughs> Arendelle is safer with me staying up here. Not safer for you. Aww. In an all too similar conversation to ones he's had with Riku at the to ones he's had with Riku at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2, his personal projection takes hold and he pursues her, determined to know why she insists on doing this. And even though it's just like while this could be, you know, this is subjective in that it's like his own experience with Riku, it's like he quite literally is just like, oh, that's what it reminds me of 
her expression and how she was acting reminds me of Riku. So it's just like, it's pretty obvious if you're like familiar with the characters, but it's like, for some people, this feels like stretching, but I'm like, man, I don't know. They pointed out later, <laughs> it kind of yeah. wraps back around. <laughs> it's also just like something you can see, but I digress. Um, uh, determined to know why she insists on doing this only for her to literally wall him out. Uh, Sora's investment from here on out is pretty clearly personal. He wants to know why she's so sad, and when he meets up with Anna, uh, he finally comes to realize his answer. I have to bring her home. And he's like, I'm sure she knows how much you love her. And then he's like, huh, huh. And then he thinks, and he has his little internal monologue, and I think maybe that's why she looks so sad. It's just like when Riku disappeared. He thought he had to push me away to protect me. Maybe Elsa's the same. Elsa chooses to run away, isolate herself, and push away the one who mattered most to her in fear of hurting Anna more than she already had. Sora has a personal connection with Anna and her position trying to save Elsa. Her determination and refusal to go home without Elsa is pretty one-to-one -one with what Sora struggled with trying to bring Riku home not all that long ago. Translation notes, in the original Japanese script, Sora is very much included in this comparison, and the use of the same word here, Taisetsu no Hito, treasured, cherished, most important person, is both used in regards to, and then accurately translated into English as love when referring to Elsa and Anna. The second time Sora says it referring to himself and Riku, it's left out of the translation. Hmm. Hmm. You really cherish Elsa. Um, it's like, so that was the meaning behind Elsa's expression. It's the same as when Riku disappeared before. It's surely because he cherishes me. There's there's an asterisk there and a little note uh, that he wouldn't let us be together. Uh, Elsa must think the same about Anna. So it was like very specifically like there is a parallel between Elsa and Anna and like how Riku was treating him. Mm hmm. Um, it's important, and here's the asterisk, uh, it's important to point out that there is no subject in uh, Japanese. Sora often s speaks this way even more so than the average speaking person. Sora simply says, surely because Taisetsu no Hito, basically. Uh, but it's through the context of the second sentence leaning to me that Riku, it's like, surely like Riku was not letting me because he cares a lot about me, like he, because cherishes so... <laughs> <clears throat> uh, in another example of thinking you know what you want only to find out what you truly want we have Anna and her quote true love Hans the movie makes a point of this being a naive and rust rushed decision it's even the catalyst of her fight with Elsa that sends her running but like the rest of the worlds Anna finds the love she truly desires the love of family not only that she grows and comes to understand her relationship with Kristoff a real relationship developed over time and built on trust and friendship it's implied this newfound romance is her true love, romantically speaking, as he comes to save her. But in her own act of true love, Anna decides, er, dedicates her final moments to save her sister's life instead of her own. Another demonstration of self-sacrifice for the person you love, which in turn had the power to revive. No! Yay. And Hans, with no speaking lines, falls to right. the ground. <laughs> And then her little breath, it's like, <laughs> oh, the little breath, oh, the little breath. Sora and Riku's parallels continue. The visual alone in Anna's stance and Elsa's crying on the ground is pretty straightforward foreshadowing of Riku's sacrifice in the Keyblade graveyard. Just as Anna did with Hans, Riku takes a stand against the oncoming demon tide, his one last act of true love for his best friend and his unwavering belief that Sora won't give up. It also reinforces the idea that, uh, hmm. That all forms of why are there two ants? What happened here? <laughs> it's just two the idea ants. That all forms of love can be considered true love. With Hercules, Eugene, and Anna, the strength to protect the one you cherish is a vital theme and a lesson. One Sora's heart is actively trying to teach him. Don't forget, mm -hmm. one that allowed them all to overcome the impossible, death. Which is exactly what happens. Exactly, exactly what happens. Exactly, exactly what happens. <laughs> it's right there. <clears throat> separation. The lesson of accepting separation for the good of each other or yourself, particularly Big Hero 6, the parallel is especially relevant, sacrifice for the greater good or for what's right at the expense of staying with a loved one. 
if you want it, since that's so I'll small. I'll keep going. If you want every toy box. <laughs> all right, toy box. I got all the toy box sections. Today. There, there you go. <laughs> we went in depth into toy box in an above section, so this will be brief. Kind of loosely applies to both parallels, literally split into two parallel worlds, accepting being part from accepting apart, being apart yeah. from Andy because he remains within their hearts and choosing to be all right with this because they can still see Sora. Toy box is weird. You can definitely tell they shoehorned this parallel into a world that didn't make sense for. That begs the question of just how important these parallels were that they had to be there. Besides, if we do go back to the real world, we'll never see you again, right? But what about Andy? You care about him so much. <laughs> His little sad face. And what I about know. Andy? What about Andy? <laughs> <laughs> and he's still right here with us. If we follow our hearts, we'll find him again. Side note, Buzz constantly looks like a five-year-old getting his <laughs> his first school photo <laughs> taken. What is... Look at him. Look at Buzz. <laughs> Look at his little face. <laughs> And like I remember because I was like putting in the picture and I couldn't stop laughing <laughs> at his face. And I was like, well, I gotta make a no. I mean, everybody has to know. <laughs> and he looked like a five-year-old getting his photo taken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at him. Oh my god. <laughs> Monstropolis. Protecting Boo and needing to send her back where she belongs to be safe. Uh Okay, sorry. Uh, protecting Boo and needing to send her back where she belongs to be safe. Separation for the well-being and good of each other. It's not a permanent separation, and compared to the rest of the world, it's not the most emotionally charged level. Overall, Monstropolis is pretty focused on Venetus and Ventus more than it does in world plot, but there's still other smaller things in the level to bring attention to. Oh, great. This time we're really stuck. And it's like, boo. Wow. <laughs> Yep, it's perfect. Boo, thank you. Every time your party gets stuck in the world with seemingly no exit trapped at a dead end, Boo either points to the solution or is the solution. The most pointed example is her power, of laughter, being necessary to short-circuit a control unit, allowing you to escape the factory, which by then has become so hostile with Unversed you're left with no choice. Uh, yep, this is the control unit for the whole factory. Randall must have messed this up. Nothing. Sorry, I could barely like read it over his fingers. <laughs> Randall must have messed this up. Nothing works. We can't get out? Uh, if we can just short it out, the lock will disengage. And this is, of course, Sora's like, maybe I'll destroy it. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> don't be <please> don't. <laughs> and lucky for us, Boo is a walking energy generator, which is also, like, interesting. Um, throughout the whole level, Boo is both a key to escape and the reason they're fleeing to begin with. Uh, throughout the whole level, you're trying to protect her and her power. Raising her laugh power meter is a featured mechanic of the level. With the end goal of sending her back to a place, another world, where she'd truly be safe. It's kind of a long story, but Boo's from another world. And we gotta send her back there to keep her safe. Like, it's quite literal. Literally. We have to save. <laughs> pirates. I wanna read, I wanna read, I wanna, I wanna oh, read pirates. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> I wrote this. I was like the only one of us that was like, and I will go through the pirates cutscenes repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also, and I think I mentioned this before, but it really is that it was like, you know, we were like, man, what's going on? All of this stuff. It really seems like, like before, before I got the game and I was like, is Kyrie some kind of surrogate? Like not Kyrie? Because where is her heart? Why is this happening? All of these things. And then I got the game the next day. And with this already in mind of, is Kyrie like, a surrogate? Like, not real Kyrie? Like, is she a Chirithi Kyrie? What's happening? And then I got to Pirates of the Caribbean, and that's when it was just like, guess what? <laughs> a surrogate Crabjack, which we're about to get to. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really like, I was sitting there, like, almost stunned, because it was right? so pointed and on the nose that i was like there is no way that this is an accident because like this doesn't happen in the movie this is not a thing that happens in the movie this was added in very very specifically so it was just like oh oh no this is uh oh, <laughs> oh. kind of like toy story with the splitting <laughs> of the world like and and like mm -hmm. they really tried to jam that they in really there they tried to like put this stuff in that it was right. just like so pointed that it was like ha hmm <laughs> anyway 
Pirates of the Caribbean. Probably the most pointed of all the worlds. The events that happen here are very close, uh, are a very cl close following to what we understand the story to be. For starters, Sora starts out in Davy Jones's locker, a physical afterlife like place that you can actually travel to. <clears throat> then Davy Jones's locker, you're saying that we've gone beyond the grave? <laughs> and pointedly, everyone came to bring Jack Sparrow back. Uh, and we're here to wrest Jack from his fate. Ah, to wrest him of his fate. Very interesting. Uh, with the idea of Sora dealing with feelings of grief, letting go, separation, and difficult choices like all of these worlds seem to be leading him towards, Pirates of the Caribbean adds an interestingly pointed original element. Surrogate Crab Jack. <laughs> After a battle with some flying heartless, Sora gets left behind. Donald and Goofy go with him, of course, but Sora is understandably feeling abandoned. And he's really just like, oh, and I was so happy that we got to see them again. So in comes Surrogate Crabjack to help him back on his feet, to help get him back on his feet. And then it's like quite literally feet <laughs> and a crab. <clears throat> this Jack was sent by Calypso, goddess of the sea, who, spe who asks Sora to free her. While this never comes to fruition, she gets released otherwise, she still helps Sora, providing him guidance and even an entire ship. Uh, Surrogate Crabjack was sent to help guide Sora, which is often used in storytelling as a means to help somebody move, move on or cope. There comes a time when they can't guide you anymore and you have to learn to stand on your own. But Jack, why do you keep saying final like you're leaving? Ah, uh, it's because this me has run its course, mate. I, the surrogate me that the goddess of the sea sent sent here to help you lot. <laughs> this is like quite literally just like surrogate. <laughs> <laughs> Considering everything, it's also of note that it's the goddess of the sea. You know, like Kyrie. <laughs> um, of course, any me is still me. I may be duplicatable, but I'm always incomparable. <laughs> uh, they also make a point that. Even if made of crabs, magic, and ocean water, that he shouldn't be taken any less seriously or sincere than the real thing. Jack is Jack, after all. A smaller thematic aside is Jack Sparrow's compass. His compass doesn't function like any regular compass. It points him towards whatever he wants most, of that, most at that time. For example, with the case of finding the Black Pearl, it comes in particularly handy. This time, however, Jack doesn't know what he really wants, and so the needle just spins, aimless like his heart. Though it is also pointed out that I, it doesn't work properly in Davy Jones's locker, but they do make a point to show it regardless, and that he doesn't know what he's doing. So, um, just spins aimless like his heart, and just like Jack, Sora doesn't know what his heart wants either. Uh, I may still have a lot to learn about love, but what um, but I know what it means to share my heart with others, and it will take more than you to break a bond like that. It's important Sora admits this, and telling that they had him say it. Sora is, at best, uh, 15, with kind of a lot on his plate, and little to no time to really contemplate his feelings. That combined with being a well-known uh, feelings stuffer, he pushes his emotions aside in favor of staying strong for others. So while he knows, knows well how to love his friends and to share his heart, he doesn't know what it is he actually wants. Not yet, anyway. Um, and then I will bring up this extra point that in the character files that they released later before Remind came out, um, or I think it came out either kind of on the same day or just like right or it came out like right around it. Dog! Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, it released like right around it, but we were definitely getting previews before Remind came out. Um, <clears throat> but there is like notably a scene that is like there's a lot of like little short stories throughout the uh, character files and there is one from Sora's perspective as he's it's related to Beast's castle is where this little short story is and he is talking about while looking at Belle and Beast that he just doesn't understand like romantic love at all like he's like I get it I get that they are in love but I don't know what that means and also it keeps bothering me and I don't know why. And like, he just talks about this kind of at length. And then he's like, I don't know. I don't know though. Like, <laughs> that's how it ends. And so it was like, interesting that like they point this out here. And I was like, huh, that seems really important. And then they have since continued on it as like yeah. more material has come out basically. 
And they really have just set things up perfectly to, and now Sora is all by his damn self with his feelings and no other distractions, probably. <laughs> so it's just like time for Sora introspection because God, what please. happens, please, because he's really just due for it, like narratively. Um, mm -hmm. And we are shown him hit like a really low point in Kingdom Hearts 3, but like nothing actually gets addressed. The problem wasn't solved. We just saw him kind of break down and then he saves everyone for sure, but he doesn't remember any of that. So it's just like those problems still there. Oh yeah. <laughs> and he's really just set up to, we're just, it's going to be Sora time. Oh my and God. And probably Riku time because we know where so he's bad. going. So <clears throat> anyway, so this definitely has proven only more so to be like it's not just some passing thing it is a point they have made repeatedly yeah um <clears throat> hammering home the overarching parallels with a sledgehammer we have will and elizabeth's separation done to save his life will was forced to stab the heart of davy jones which in turn made him the new captain of the flying dutchman this grants him life though resigns him to a fate to remain separated from the one he loves uh, just wed, and now she and Captain Turner must live in different worlds. A textbook example of star-crossed lovers, crossing paths but destined to part. One day ashore, ten years at sea, it's a steep price. Understandably, Sora laments on the lack of time with those you care about. One day isn't enough time. Like, oh, there's always enough time for hearts to say what's true. Sora, you know better than anyone. It only takes a moment to connect with your mates. And then he falls up, he's like, with your hearties. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and we round it all off with the closing emphasis on the fact that no matter how short the time you spend with those you care about, it's what you make of it. Sometimes in the face of a cruel fate, it has to be enough. But that doesn't make it any less meaningful. Can we can we just appreciate once again the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean graphics and how... Yeah, the just... like actually very like rendered God. like beautiful cutscenes unbelievable <laughs> these were and how they actually managed to make donald and goofy look like they like fit in <laughs> in mm -hmm. this world of yeah like no the cohesion people. was like great amazing and like what was it i love there was this one tweet i remember seeing forever ago that was like showing the clip where it's just like and you know davy jones is talking at will and elizabeth and everything and he's like you know oh, i'm gonna stab one of them like that whole like scene and then like Sora's like foot comes into frame but the tweet was just like I had no idea this wasn't the actual movie until right? Sora's big goofy shoe <laughs> it, like, it was so funny <laughs> it was but so really, funny every time I think about it I'm like oh my oh my god it's really like in you see like how good it is especially in like Jack's expressions like it's like yeah. really in the eyes and everything yeah. and I'm always just like whoa <laughs> this is like we have in many aspects surpassed that uncanny valley territory with right like a lot of like these bits and pieces it's not always that all the time but it is that like i would say more often than not so yeah. it's just like yeah. wow this looks um fucking incredible what did you really guys amazing. do <laughs> and pirate mm -hmm. sora is just adorable and he's so cute and i love so cute i love him oh my god with my whole heart oh my god <laughs> So and I love how excited he is to be a pirate. To be a pirate! Oh my god! I'm <laughs> really like, I, I was like seeing Sora realize his dream of yeah, like yes. being a pirate. It it's like it's so great, especially because I did not care for Port Royal in Kingdom Hearts Two. It is one of my least favorite worlds. Um, and so I was like, wow, I do not care about this. And then right, the like the just. Pirates of the Caribbean like became one of my favorite worlds. <laughs> they made Hearts you care, 3, you know. <laughs> so how like, good oh. they did. Ugh. Really turned it around for yes. me, you know. <clears throat> Beautiful. All right, San anyway. Francisco, dealing with grief and separation, explicitly the separation of death, and how no one is truly gone from your life if you keep them in your heart. This has gone over twice with both Dashi and the original Baymax. At the point Sora comes into San Francisco, Hiro's already somewhat dealt with his grief over Tadashi's death, Sora, and Sora empathizes. Yeah, T Tadashi, there was a fire, and now he's gone. He's still here, in Baymax, in all of us. Tadashi, he lives in your hearts. 
and this would be enough on its own as a lesson for Sora, learning to deal with grief and separation, that he could keep his loved ones in his heart and sometimes that's enough. Except, Tadashi is the secondary focus of this world. The primary focus is Hiro's grief over the original Baymax, that he's forced to confront again when Riku Nord brings him back as an evil shell of his former self with his damaged battle chip. That stinky dark Riku. A stinky darkness. <laughs> Where'd he get that? <coughs> That's the first chip I made for Baymax. It's full of combat programs. Does that mean it's like his heart? Now, if you forget <clears throat> the entire plot of Big Hero 6, like we somehow did for a month even while writing this, let's give a brief rundown of what exactly happened to the original Baymax. <laughs> this was one of the last things we wrote for the theory, yeah. by the way. Like, this was just a weird small gap before we released it. And I was like, look, I need some help fleshing this out because I know there's stuff here, but I am so scrambled trying to write everything else. So Cal was like, okay, don't worry. I have this handled and went to start writing for Big Hero 6. It was like, hold on. We're so stupid. <laughs> it was, why did we not think about this? And just like, Bruh! and just like wrote it all out. So this was Cal. And that's why it's, uh, if you forgot the entire plot of Big Hero 6, like <laughs> we somehow did for a month, <laughs> then here we go. <laughs> all right. So when traveling with Hero to an alternate dimension to save Callahan's daughter, Abigail, Baymax is struck and damaged, leaving them in a hopeless situation with no way out. In a last-ditch effort, with no other option, Baymax sacrifices himself, using his armor's rocket fist to propel Hero and Abigail back through the portal, saving their lives at the expense of his own. He convinces Hero to accept this by saying he will always be with him. In Kingdom Hearts terms, in his heart. But that's not the only thing. At the end of the movie, Hero finds Baymax's healthcare chip clenched in the armor fist, what has already been described as the equivalent of Baymax's heart. In a heartfelt and happy ending, Hero reconstructs an entirely new Baymax body and they're able to continue their lives. In hindsight, it's all a little on the nose. <laughs> Even <clears throat> more suspicious is the only time Baymax's sacrifice is mentioned, it's Hero's vaguely saying he vanished into another dimension, why hint at the climax of the movie so obscurely, especially after all the worlds which were explicit movie recreations? Yeah, this is... this is Baymax. Th I'm sorry. Yeah, this Baymax. He's actually the second model. But the first Baymax in the chip I made vanished into another dimension along with the microbots. The chip's back, so the first Baymax might be back too. But now we're left with the game original plot of the world where the original Baymax is brought back, but controlled by dark cubes, or bugs. Hero's conflict shows he's very much considers the first and second Baymax two different beings. Despite how similar they are, they're not the same. Riku Nort even states, though he went through all this... Though he went through all this to create a complete heart from the damaged battle chip, that the original Baymax's heart is still lost. Don't bother. This puppet has lost his heart. He won't wake up. Speaking of, we've seen this exact phrase before, complete with a 15-year-old possessed Riku and everything. That girl has lost her heart. She cannot wake up. Mm -hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> Directly paralleling the original Baymax with Kairi. The story of the world then becomes Hero having to accept the loss of the original Baymax again, reiterating and reinforcing that separation is okay and even necessary. This time, despite the protests of his team and Sora, Hero chooses to destroy what's left of the original Baymax, chooses the separation himself, because this Baymax has lost his heart, and this is not what either Baymax or Tadashi would have wanted. We'll have to destroy the chip if we want to be certain. It's the right thing to do. Tadashi would have done the same thing. Isn't that Baymax's heart? It's okay. Baymax is here. I should be the one. And in the end... From the leftover body, he builds what's essentially a third Baymax. Two Baymaxes! Woohoo! That whole scene when he goes to crush the chip, by the way, is like, it's playing this like real, like, pretty and like forlorn feeling uh, rendition, like piano rendition of a uh, Distant From You. Mm. Uh, from Dream Drop, which is like, I love that song anyway, but like, this song specifically for in this scene is like, really nice but it has this like very kind of like sad hollowness to it with like 
oh what they're dealing with you know yeah. this very sad thing but it's just like if you think if like watch that scene just like just listen to the music i think it's on the soundtrack i think i'm not sure it's very good though i love it <laughs> <clears throat> all right the 100 acre wood this short and optional world has two very good points. One, the heffalump. <laughs> two, growing up and apart from your friends and Sora's fear of losing them. Friends, in a general sense, sure. He has, he says as much to Merlin, but upon closer inspection, a very specific friend. Those book covers sure look sadly familiar. Indeed they do. This mm -hmm. is another part that just blew my mind. I was like losing it. Yeah, yeah. It's um this was something that like while we were sitting on this, we actually had people bring this up to us. So it was like it was nice that like we weren't the only ones who were seeing the parallel, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh despite the fact that people want to think that like we have some kind of vendetta against it. Right. It was just like, dude, I am not the only one. Like I was brought right. there were people people made like Reddit posts about it and stuff, and I was like already writing it and I was like, uh, there, there <laughs> it is. <laughs> but Anyway, as we can see, the Winnie the Pooh, and then oh. there they are sitting together mm. in a flight. Oh. But when it's, oh, it's just Kyrie and it's dark. Oh, oh, no. It's very sad, actually. <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, but it is not just one simple visual parallel this world has to offer. <clears throat> your home. Pooh greets Sora's arrival with your home. Not to be written off as simply awkward dialogue, it's the same in both scripts. We double-checked to make sure that this was a significant point we were making. Um, Sora himself denotes Pooh's greeting as confusing. Uh, huh? Good to see you, Pooh. Only to be clarified a bit later with Pooh's worry over Sora's weakened connection and disappearance from his heart. You used to be right here. Why is it that you went away? Away? Oh, that's what you meant by your home. So it was, you know, it was something that, like, Sora was like, that's weird, why are you saying that, you know? And then it was like, oh, later on. <clears throat> but Pooh's noted and questioned use of your home is another pointed parallel with the only other person who said it. Your home. Your home. Not to say Sora himself hasn't also said it in direct reference. Where he does this. Uh, to be completely honest, we're not sure what to, what this specific parallel from Sora to Aqua implies here, but it's there. Because uh, that was something that I was like, I kept scrounging around trying to figure out, like, because this obviously was like a callback to yeah. when Kyrie was saying you're home, but I couldn't find any anything related to it. I guess I was like, okay, it's the Kyrie thing, but why here and to Aqua? What is this supposed yeah, to mean? They're both mean? on the I beach can't... of Destiny Island. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, that's still something that I'm just like, I'm just not sure, like, what this is supposed to be telling us. But I yeah. am pointing out it's there. It's something. <clears throat> but it is, it's definitely that if anything that reinforces that it's like, this is a reference to Kyrie saying, you're home. Mm -hmm. And Pooh says, you're home. And Sora's like, why did you say that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sora admits to himself that the connection has weakened. But even though he's confused and a little worried, Sora insists it's fine, reconciling with Pooh that they'll always be together, always connected. Uh, except I can feel it. Our hearts, or our connection's weaker. What matters is I'll be here from now on. And he boop, boop, and he taps his little Pooh Bear chest. <clears throat> right on that little red shirt of his. Uh, after leaving, though, um, after leaving, though visibly upset and worried about his weakening connections and that he doesn't understand why, Merlin offers some kindly advice. Whatever's lost can be found again. There are always new paths between hearts for us to discover and traverse. Which is, uh, very pointed. <laughs> traverse, Merlin. <laughs> ah. Thanks, Merlin, for that pointed and important lesson. Whatever is lost can be found again. Hmm, we'll keep a pin in that one. Uh, at the end of the day, <clears throat> all of the worlds put together have one co have one other consistent theme. Sora himself is unable to stop these unfortunate events from happening. He's left helpless each time in the face of these larger conflicts outside of himself. He sees his friends going through trouble, and it isn't he himself doing the saving for once. Larxene makes a point to tell him to leave Elsa alone to figure it out for herself, and in the end, he didn't influence what path she took whatsoever. 
he's either saved by an outside force or his own outside force isn't solving the problem. Like, he doesn't actually do anything to save Eugene and Rapunzel. Mm -hmm. Um, He... I'm trying to think. I, I remember going over this, and then I eventually I was just like, ah, I'll put stuff in for this later, and then I and then I didn't. But it was something that we went through. But it was like a lot of these things are like big things happen, and Sora is there witnessing it, and we know that his heart is trying to like teach him something, at the very least. But like it keeps being a thing where like he's not necessarily the one in control, which is just like an interesting through line. Yeah. Anyway, the power of waking. Oh, somebody pointed out, uh, like, Will getting stabbed was another thing oh, he couldn't prevent. right. Right. Yep, yep. And then sucker punching Davy Jones, and he gets on there, and he just beats on him. <laughs> he just Damn, goes absolutely Sora. ape all over him. <laughs> anyway, the oh, power of power waking. Power of waking. After we're done with the Disney worlds, we get to saving Aqua and Ventus. Sora's quest to regain the power of waking ends here in this section. This section also shows us how the power of waking ties in with the strength to protect. Ventus has consistently throughout the game managed to force his consciousness through Sora every time the prospect of saving Aqua comes up, literally waking from sleep. And when Aqua is in danger right in front of him, when he ac can actually do something to protect her, the thought gives his sleeping heart enough strength to break through to Sora. This is what allows him to guide Sora through awakening his heart. Translation note. Now, the English version of this scene is pretty accurate, but we're making note of the Japanese version because it's a bit clearer. What should I do? Use the power of waking. But I haven't got that power back yet. You didn't lose it. It's sleeping. It will wake up for the sake of someone else. For the sake of someone else, with all my heart. Sora regains the ability to use the power of waking by realizing, specifically, it's summoned by wanting to protect someone with all his heart. With this, a callback to what Herc said, S Sora starts being able to use the power of waking on command. Suddenly, I wanted to save her with all my heart, but... Again and again, it all goes back to that first Herc parallel. In the first world, right before Riku's first cutscene, they had already introduced us to the secret power of waking. And it falls in line with what we know from DDD, how easy it was for Riku to use the power of waking from the start, how intuitively he managed to dive into Sora's heart at the very end of the game. If it's connected to the strength to protect, of course he'd be adept at it. He's been doing it since he was a child. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it makes sense then that in the KH3 we play, the first time we see Sora use the power of waking is to save Riku. Bing. I made it! <laughs> this isn't just suspected or connecting some disparaging dots. This is hard fact described within the game itself. Oh boy. <laughs> the three realms. <laughs> the can you read it realms. okay? I can. Okay, okay. Worlds in the realm of light and the realm between exist as planets in a great sea of stars, which Sora and his friends explore aboard their smile-powered gummy ship. The realm of darkness, however, exists in a space closed off from time. It is accessible only via dark corridors, pathways that open for agents of darkness or when worlds become unstable, or by using the power of waking. As a result, Aqua has spent years wander wandering the realm of darkness, unable to return to the light. As we returned to the gummy ship, Chip and Dale collided, called with distressing news. They'd lost contact with Riku and the king within the realm of darkness. Sora let his heart be his guiding key, and we went through the gate that he created. Sorry, continue. <laughs> the gate led to the Destiny Islands, where Sora found an old keyblade lying on the beach. We discovered a door that could only lead to the realm of darkness, and Sora proceeded through it alone, leaving the rest of us to anxiously await his return. Sora followed Riku's voice to the shore of a dark sea. We double-checked. Both the Japanese and English glossary specify that, outside of using Mickey's Keyblade, the only way to enter the Realm of Darkness is with either a Dark Corridor, which we know Sora can't use, and we know definitely doesn't look like a giant glowing door of light, or the Power of Waking. And the journal even specifies his heart led him to the Door of Light. 
It's the most likely conclusion then, especially since we know the power of waking's intended purpose is related to reaching worlds through hearts. It's for tra traversing hearts to reach worlds, not for traversing worlds to reach hearts. So it's definitely important that the power Sora spent the whole game looking for has been tied to something so intrinsic to Riku's character this whole time, was used for Riku first, awakened by his desire to save him. There are a lot of places and planes and worlds that sleeping keyholes could lead to, considering we're already in the sleeping realm. It's purposefully vague and we're not given all hmm. the answers. Hmm, what is, what is, I see my name popping around on the, <laughs> as I'm looking at this, I'm like, huh? Huh? could lead to considering where, did, uh, this may have been like a weird leftover sentence from another part when I've shifted things around. Cause sure. I'm like, wait a second, that doesn't make any. Live editing, <clears> hey. <throat> This is good. Live editing. Press I don't triangle see... to Sora. Yeah. Because this would go at the other spot. I'm just going to, I'm going to, live editing. Live editing. Here Clean we're doing it. Clean it up. That shouldn't be there. We just did, <laughs> just nix that part out. It's fine. It's fine. <clears throat> Before we go on, uh, this is a good time to take a break and to yes. uh, cut this video. And then there will be one more going through the rest of the, the rest of the theory. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you have this beautifulness to look forward to. Oh mm -hmm. man. Remind. I don't think I've it. seen this part. Have I, you not seen it? I think you know this what? is brand new to me. Do you want a fun little uh, tidbit really quick? Yeah. This was something that like I had like sketched this out, actually. And I was like, Canary, make this, but like good looking. <laughs> and like, here, I, I put it here. I put it in Discord oh, so nice. you can see it. <laughs> Do you want me to bring it up <laughs> on stream? Can, pull, can I? Yeah, you can, you can pull okay. it up. Yeah, 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 please. But it was like, that was me. I was like, do yes. something like do something like this yes <laughs> miggy, miggy. <laughs> to light connections oh my Sleepy gosh keyhole magic look at it it's like a sora it's like mixture <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah so yeah that was that was uh me going like canary make this but good nice and then canary did <laughs> wow and then, <laughs> and then she did ah oh. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Love it. 